Welcome to our uh, first part of our three part of Oscar Fisher Primer. We're going to draw a lot, so uh, you'll need some basic drafting tools for tonight. You know, you don't really need a real drafting table set up. All you really need is a pen or a pencil, uh, some way to draw straight lines and right angles. Uh, it could be a drafting table uh, or a T square or builder square or something like that. And even for tonight, you can just freehand it. Uh, and you need some way of drawing curved lines, so a, a compass or a uh, like a, a circle template will do great. And we sent out an email with a paper template that you can use, kind of a layout uh, for tonight's drawings. If you didn't receive that, you can uh, email Alyssa and she can send you a copy of that. You can also just do your own layout at the uh, end after a brief slide presentation, we'll do all the drawings. And uh, you can use the template that we sent out or use your own paper. For those of you uh, who are UVU students in ARC 1010, uh, the layout needs to be about eight and a half by 11. So it can be a page in your sketchbook or eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. You could use graph paper too, if that helps to, to keep things you know, orthogonal. And uh, you'll probably need an eraser as well, unless you're like me and you never make mistakes. Uh, no, just kidding. Oh, erasers are my best friend. And uh, that's about all that you'll need for uh, tonight's class. My name is Paul Monson. I am the president of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art Utah chapter. Um, I also teach architecture full-time at Utah Valley University here in the beautiful Wasatch Mountains. And I'm originally from the East Coast. I was born in Manhattan and uh, went to Notre Dame uh, for my master's degree. I worked in Philadelphia for a few years and then came out to Utah and uh, designed temples for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, for uh, about 10 years. And then I, you know, I've always wondered what it was like to be um, in abject poverty. So I decided to become a, a professor. So that's what I do now. Uh, it's been a long road and I'm grateful for all of it. I'm uh, grateful for all the UVU students who are joining us tonight. And we have lots of professional designers out there. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we're very grateful for our sponsors, FFKR Architects and uh, Sagrada Design Studio. So tonight's class will be about an hour, uh, maybe an hour and a half. I have about a 20 minute slide presentation and that will set the table and introduce some concepts. And then we'll have our main course, which is to uh, draw the moldings. For our UVU students, there may be a little repetition uh, here from what we've done in class, uh, but that's okay, repetition is good. So uh, we wanna start with a question, a difficult question for sure. How to define the word classical? This is after all the classical architecture primer, but what does that word mean? Um, if you have thoughts about that, you can type them into the chat if you like. I think there are few words in the English language that are as fraught with disagreement, complexity, and misunderstanding as the word classical. Maybe a Republican and Democrat might uh, come close. But you know, your definition of classical can say more about you than about the word itself, it seems. So let's wrestle with this word a little bit. Uh, what we see uh, in this image, the Roman Forum through the Arch of Septimius Severus is certainly classical architecture, right? No question about that. Uh, the buildings are from what historians call the classical period uh, in ancient history. So some of you have probably walked around the ancient forum. If you're a UVU student, we're going to do a study abroad next year to Greece and Rome. And many other cultures look to a classical period as well. China, Japan, uh, India, the Middle East, they all have a period that's kind of a golden age uh, when there is a flourishing of culture, art, and poetry. 
And of course, no period was perfect. We uh, are rightfully troubled by the moral failings of uh, people like slavery and, and injustice, and no one's excusing those, but we do appreciate the heights of human achievement uh, despite their human shortcomings, which we have plenty of ourselves. So we don't really have moral high ground in some respects. But uh, politics aside, one definition of uh, classical architecture is simply uh, buildings that use these forms and elements uh, from the classical period, whether that more recent buildings we would talk about as neoclassical or contemporary classical. Uh, that's one definition. But we might argue that classical is deeper than that. I would push back on someone who calls their building classical but is just using uh, Corinthian columns, pasting them on in a superficial or, or lazy way. So another layer to the definition would include a set of principles. Things like geometry, harmony, proportion, uh, tectonics, which is a structural logic. And uh, we could add others uh, as well, like durability, uh, ornament, craftsmanship. It's a long list. Uh, and the last definition I'll propose is the sense that something uh, can be widely accepted as a standard of excellence. It's timeless. Uh, it's a classic, right? So classical, I would argue, is a big umbrella. It includes uh, much more than ancient buildings, although admittedly, uh, not everyone agrees on the exact same definition. Uh, as we begin the study uh, of the classical tradition, we start with the moldings and the orders, but we quickly uh, realize that it's much deeper and much more challenging to learn than we thought. Uh, one of my favorite writers, Stephen Sen, said this, classical architecture only begins with the orders, and the student who has mastered them according to any of the standard models and methods has acquired only the tools of the trade. So as is the case for a child learning to write, mastery of the alphabet does not bring with it fluency in prose to say nothing uh, of poetry. Just like when we see a dancer uh, who makes balance and grace look effortless, or someone playing the violin, and we think, oh, you know, I could totally do that. And then we try it, and we're instantly humbled. Uh, it's the same with design. Classical architecture, it doesn't stop at the alphabet or simple sentences. It's full of complexity and nuance, just as forms in nature or compositions in poetry or dance or other classical arts. Since we're teaching this class in the 21st century and not the 1700s or something, we need to acknowledge that these classical principles have been criticized and basically discarded for the most part over the last 100 years. Uh, as my kids would say, they've been roasted. Uh, our, our built environment today is largely a product of the anti-classical movement of modernism, which argues that the classical orders and forms from the past are too simplistic and constraining. And that's the way most designers are trained today. But I think hindsight works both ways, cuts both ways. And now we have a hundred years of modernism. We can evaluate the fruits of that as well and judge for ourselves, uh, which is more humane. And maybe it's not a fair comparison because I picked oppressively monotonous modernist buildings here. Uh, they aren't all as bleak as Hong Kong skyscrapers, but we've all experienced this tendency in contemporary architecture to kind of reduce everything to widgets, to um, a grid like zeros and ones of a computer program, which can feel like uh, being stuck in a matrix. Our building here at UVU, I'm here on campus, the floor pattern is actually the, a circuit board. It looks like a circuit board of, the, of a computer, just to drive home the, the uh, idea that we're just part of a machine. So I, I think uh, we need to uh, look to the past and look for timeless principles 
of whatever style of architecture you design, we can all benefit from uh, these classical principles, which emphasize uh, harmony and subtle geometric relationships from the largest scale and plan and elevation uh, down to uh, the smallest detail. So the, the Renaissance architect uh, Alberti defined beauty as a harmony of all the parts uh, fitted together with such proportion and connection that nothing could be added, diminished or altered, but for the worse." End quote. Uh, beauty then in the classical sense is more objective and measurable than just a kind of subjective feeling. And it has a purpose. Beauty directs our minds to the underlying order and geometry that we observe in the universe, in natural things and in our own uh, human bodies. The designer's goal is to create things that resonate with other people by reminding us of how we're designed ourselves, by bringing proportional relationships in harmony with each other. So why do we start with the moldings and the orders? Why do we bother learning about these old fashioned things and drawing them? The Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, composite. Uh, when we teach these classes, I often get asked, why? Why should we care about this? Um, so these are the five classical orders of architecture, each from different regions of the ancient world in Italy and, and Greece. We can learn about them as historic relics, but I would propose that they have more than just historic value for designers. From an aesthetic or a design perspective, forgetting about history for a minute, you can think of the classical orders as poetic fusions of math and sculpture. So the right brain and the left brain as designers, we find geometric order in nature, and we use that geometry to create beautiful forms. The classical orders are paradigms of this. They aren't the only examples, of course, uh, but they are archetypes that embody these classical principles uh, in really sophisticated ways, so we can learn a lot by studying them. Um, I like analogies, and while it's not a perfect analogy, architecture is a little like the culinary arts. When we learn to cook, we follow a recipe that tells us the ratio or proportion of this to that that makes something taste good. And the orders you could think of as a recipe of how to draw something with good proportion so that it looks good. Uh, one of the important proportions, there are many others, but uh, one of them as an example is the width uh, to the height of a column. And you'll notice that each of these columns gets a little more slender from left to right. So we use the letter D to mean diameter of the column or the width in elevation. And a conventional set of proportions for the orders is the Tuscan starts at seven diameters in height, the Doric in eight, uh, the Ionic at nine, and the Corinthian and composite are both um, 10 times as high as the diameter. Uh, another analogy, I, I think of choosing a proportional system kind of like choosing the key to compose a piece of, of music uh, or choosing the meter of a poem. Uh, if we have musicians in the class, uh, just like a composer you know, decides upfront if a piece will be in the key of C sharp minor or G major, and then carries that all the way through, an architect decides on the proportional system and carries it through from top to bottom. Um, it might be one of these column types that drives the proportion of a neoclassical building, or it might be a different proportional system, but the orders provide a, a, a sure way of proportioning things that is time-tested. Um, but other proportional systems, in different styles like uh, Art Deco or Romanesque Revival might be the, the system that's used for the designer. And the important thing is to have control as a designer and know what you're doing 
and, and why you're doing it. Um, it does come down to details, of course, whatever the style it is, traditional architecture can be broken down into smaller and smaller parts, each of which has a relationship to the others uh, and to the whole. So like a symphony in music, you can keep subdividing it down until you get to the individual notes. And the same is true uh, with architecture. The order is made of a column and entablature, and the column is made of a capital and shaft and the base. And the base you can break down into smaller parts, smaller and smaller until you get to the, the very simple shapes, what I call the, the DNA of architecture. And uh, these shapes are the classical moldings. In language, we learn the ABCs. In architecture, we begin with the moldings, the smallest physical units. So this is the alphabet that we'll be drawing together, uh, 17 different profiles that can be combined and manipulated by an experienced designer in endless varieties. Uh, we have them organized here by morphology or shape. Um, when we walk down the molding aisle in Home Depot, uh, it can feel intimidating with all of these choices, but really it's quite simple. Moldings are either straight, convex, concave, or compound. Uh, for straight moldings, we have the fascia, the fillet, either the raised or sunk fillet, and the splay. Uh, for the convex moldings, we have the ovalo, the torus, the bead, the three-quarter round, and the thumb. And concave moldings are the cavetto, the half hollow, the three-quarter hollow, the scotia, and the conge. And the compound moldings are the cyma, well, the cyma reversa, the cyma recta, and the, the beak. So those are the moldings that we're gonna be drawing today. One way to think about them is that each molding follows and reflects the laws of physics in some way. You could think about how objects deform under pressure or weight. If you ever played with Play-Doh or stepped on a balloon, you can visualize this uh, deformation. Uh, so that's the way that supporting moldings look. The shapes that curve back and in to indicate support. And other moldings express their function in different ways. So terminating moldings flare out at the top like a crown. Separating moldings go between elements. And transitioning moldings uh, go at the base where you have a vertical uh, transitioning to a horizontal. And taking these simple uh, standard molding profiles, adding sculptural ornament, uh, and composing them uh, together with an eye for uh, rhythm, and variety and texture, we can create something as graceful as this Corinthian entablature. All from just a few basic uh, shapes of curves and straights, and then uh, add an ornament. Uh, a nice little book if you want to uh, take a deeper dive into moldings is Walker's Theory of Moldings from 1926, which has this pithy quote I like, moldings are honorable things which uh, are not to be treated casually or copied blindly. Um, I remember after one molding class, we did an experienced architect came up to me and said, I'm so glad to learn this. And he was kind of whispering because he didn't want anyone else to hear. I'm so glad to learn this because I've just been making this up my whole career. Uh, so <laughs> let's not make this up uh, as designers. Take control of the language that you use, know the alphabet, and uh, from there it's spelling and grammar and composition, writing be beautiful poetry. Uh, the, the more you know the moldings, the more uh, you know how to use them to create the right architecture for, say, a colonial interior. Uh, the base, the door and window casing, the crown molding, all in well balanced proportion to the rest of the room, uh, there are your moldings uh, to the right, a, a handsome colonial interior. And with a few subtle changes, 
uh, in profile and proportion, the same elements, base, door, and window casing, crown, are transformed into a Gothic revival interior with the pointed arch window and the, the tracery in the door pan. Um, or sleek and modern, like a, an art deco interior. Change the moldings, change the style. Uh, each of these examples, while obviously very different from each other, uh, is internally consistent, following Alberti's definition of, of beauty that's fitted or stitched together uh, with proportion. So we wouldn't put this door into the colonial interior or vice versa. And at first, uh, you know, we may just have an intuitive sense uh, that it wouldn't look right, but through practice uh, and experience, we learn why it doesn't look right uh, and how to manipulate these elements to do what you want because moldings are powerful little things. And just a final quote before we draw from the 17th century uh, English architect, Sir Christopher Wren, he said, architecture aims at eternity. Uh, it may feel at first like you're following a recipe. It may feel a little bit formulaic um, and might not feel very creative, but stick with it. And, and you'll start to see the, the magic as uh, you transcend mere formulas and uh, start soaring to great heights of uh, beauty and eternity. So have patience with yourself, trust yourself, and enjoy the journey. Let's go ahead and, and draw. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and try to switch to my other camera. So you all need uh, your drawing tools. For this, you can see how I've got this set up. And if you have printed out the template, that will make it uh, pretty easy to uh, get started. If you haven't, if you just need to, uh, if you've got a blank sheet of paper, you're going to want to go ahead and create a grid on your paper uh, that has uh, five boxes across and four boxes down. If you're in my uh, ARC 1010 class, you're going to want to put your name on this, and this is what you're going to turn in for your uh, assignment. Uh, we'll start with the, the straight moldings. So if you, if you need, uh, I'll, I'll just stall a little bit for those of you who are still uh, getting set up. So uh, you can go ahead on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. These boxes are going to be about uh, two inches. These, each of these squares that will fit pretty nicely. And then on the left hand side, uh, we're going to write th those uh, categories of moldings, their shapes. So we have straight at the top row, then convex, uh, concave, and compound uh, across the left-hand side. And uh, you can give your drawing a title if you want uh, classical moldings. We'll start with the straight ones, the easiest, and uh, then they'll get harder. And uh, I'm just going to draw them for the most part freehand, uh, and then I'm going to use uh, a, a circle template. You can use a, uh, a compass to draw the, the circles. That works as well, but I find with the, the shapes that we're going to draw, they're, they're pretty small, and so a circle template might work best. Uh, and you can draw your, your straight lines with the straight edge if you want, or you can just uh, freehand them. And stick around uh, at the end. Uh, if we have time, I will uh, show just a couple of examples in uh, CAD and in SketchUp if you're interested in uh, how to do the moldings uh, on those uh, in that computer software. But we're going to draw them uh, right now by hand. So let's start 
uh, with the straight ones. At the top row, um, the first one is uh, fascia. So F-A-S-C-I-A. Uh, for the fascia, it is it can be uh, vertical or, or horizontal, but this one we're going to draw as a vertical. The fascia, uh, it can be any length, really. And we're just going to step it back at the top and bottom to uh, make it clear of what we're drawing. And for each of these drawings, we're going to uh, add some lines at a 45 degree angle on the outside to make it look three-dimensional. And then we'll add some uh, hatch lines to show this as if it's uh, material that's being cut through. And then I'm gonna go ahead with a pen and just darken that edge of what's being cut. The, the fascia, uh, we call it a fascia. You know, English is a mix of so many different languages. And uh, the fascia comes from uh, the Latin, meaning a band or a, a ribbon. So it's a different root than the word for face, uh, although those words are sometimes uh, conflated. Um, we still use this word a lot, fascia in home construction. It's that uh, vertical board that's just below the roof that we attach the, the gutter to. We call that the fascia, a, a flat band. The next two are the, the fillets. So we have uh, the raised fillet. and the sunk fillet. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a way to lock this camera. I know that it kind of goes in and out of, of focus. I apologize for that. We'll just do the best with what we've got. So the, the raised fillet, um, Fillet comes from the Latin or French for, for binding uh, with a string or thread. And uh, we're, we'll draw the first one. It's uh, similar to a fascia. The difference between a fillet and a fascia is just the size of it. A fillet is a small uh, vertical face. So we'll add the 45 degree lines. Catch the material we're cutting through. And darken our cut line. For the raised fillet. And the sunk fillet is just the inverse of that. So it's an innie instead of an Audi. That's the sunk fillet. Let me know if I'm going too fast. I need to slow down. Fillets are separating moldings. So they're used uh, when you want to uh, end one thing and start something else. Or they can be kind of a, an edge condition. The last one of the straight moldings is called the splay. And the, when a fascia is tilted at an angle, then we call it a splay. So we're gonna draw it at a 45 degree, but it could be uh, any angle. It could be, this one's angled down, but it could be angled up. Let's draw our extension lines. Hatch that 
and darken our cut line. Those are all the possibilities for the straight moldings. The convex is next, and I still get confused between concave and convex. I have to like mentally remind myself, okay, concave, convex. Uh, the, the easiest way to remember is to think of a cave, right? We say something caves in, uh, concave uh, uh, is like a, like a cave, it has a hole, it, it goes in. So uh, and convex, I just remember it as the opposite of concave. Uh, it's it curves out. Um, we're going to have some new vocabulary words with convex moldings. Uh, the first one is called the ovolo, O V O L O. And for these, I'm going to use my uh, circle template. The ovolo is uh, often called a quarter round by carpenters. And the way that we'll draw them tonight is to just lightly draw in our full circle. And then for the ovolo, we're only going to use uh, one quarter of it. So we can add uh, a line here and a line there. And this is the only part of the molding that we're using. So let's add our extension lines to that and hatch. So that's the, the ovolo molding. Um, ovolo comes from the Latin ovum uh, for egg. And uh, the way we've drawn it here, and let me go ahead and darken my cut line. The way we're drawing it, uh, the ovolo is a supporting molding. So it's holding something up. You often see this in column capitals, that ovolo, quarter round molding. But it can also be turned upside down the other way and used uh, as a quarter round at the bottom of the, a room as a, as a transition molding. The next one is the torus. So with the ovolo, we only used one quarter of the circle. With the torus, we're going to use a half of the circle. So we can lightly sketch in our full circle. And then the torus is just going to be half of it. Like that, like a belly. Uh, torus comes from the Latin for uh, a bulge or, or a swelling or a cushion. So that's our torus. Um, let me hatch that. And, you know, when we're learning new vocabulary at first, it can be maybe a little bit embarrassing to use these new words or people don't, uh, aren't used to them. But if we all use them, then it's the people who don't use them that sound strange, right? So let's all use the correct names for moldings. The next one is an easy one. Uh, it's a bead, um, just like the beads of, of a necklace. And this is the same as the torus. It's really just a matter of scale. So with a bead, um, these are smaller. They're often used as a little punctuation and, and they can be grouped together. So we're gonna draw three of them in a series on top of each other. And then again, like a torus, we're just using one half of those beads. 
add our extension lines. Patch it in. And darken our cut line. Uh, the next one is the three quarter round. But some we don't have to learn new vocabulary. Someone's got to come up with a better name than the three quarter round. If you have any ideas, just go ahead and type it in the chat. The three quarter round is three quarters of a circle, obviously. So we'll lightly pencil in our circle. And then we're going to take three quarters of it this time. Draw our extension lines. As if it's extending out into space. And so that's that's our three quarter round. You don't see this as often, the three quarter round, sometimes on an outside corner to really emphasize um, that round uh, shape at the corner that sticks off the surface. The last one of the convex is the thumb molding. And it's easy to remember, uh, it looks like a little thumb. Uh, it's kind of a flattened or a, a lopsided curve. Um, so it's like a torus, but not a perfect half circle. There are lots of different ways to uh, draw it. You, it could be uh, part of an ellipse or just a freehand uh, shape. But we're going to learn one way, which is that the, uh, the, the top is part of a larger circle, and then the lower part is part of a smaller circle. So if you have a circle template, and uh, you start that circle with a larger diameter and then find the, the center of your circle. And then you'll finish it with a smaller circle. So I'm gonna take one uh, from, from down here. And we want those uh, ends of our curves to be tangent to each other. So I'm going to put the center of this next circle on the same horizontal line and then complete another quarter circle. So that's, that's a thumb molding. Kind of like a, a torus, but lopsided. And feel free if you have questions as we go or you're falling behind or something is not making sense, just go ahead and uh, turn on your mic and uh, ask your question. But if not, I'll just keep marching ahead. Everyone see those okay? All right, so we've got our, our straight moldings at the top, the fascia, raised fillet, sunk fillet, and splay. Can you go a little slower? <laughs> Sure. Thank you. Yep. Um, I had a question. Can yep. you, without redrawing the thumb, can you just go through the process of redrawing that last one? I would be happy to. There, there are a lot of ways to draw the thumb molding. Um, this is this is one way, 
and uh, it gives a particular shape to the thumb molding. But the idea with a thumb molding is that um, it's not a consistent quarter or half of a circle, right? It's, um, it's changing its radius as it goes from the top to the bottom. So, so what I did is um, rather than taking like the, with the torus, we did the whole thing as one, uh, one circle, right? We took half of a single diameter all the way from top to bottom. With the thumb, we're going to just do part of it with a larger diameter. So I took this larger circle here um, and completed it halfway. So I went halfway down. And then I switched to a different radius, a different size circle, a smaller one for the bottom half. And obviously it would depend on which circle you change to, whether it's half the radius or a third of the radius or very close to the same radius, how much that uh, is going to be noticeable of the change in the curve. Does that make sense? So that yes, thank you. Those circles have different centers. You've got this, this bigger circle out here. I'll just draw the rest of the circle so it's clear. So we've got that, that larger circle and then the smaller circle for the other half. Are there any that you'd like me to review? Any others before we move on? We're about halfway through. Um, we've got our straight moldings and our convex moldings, the, the ovolo, the torus, uh, the bead, which are just smaller little torus moldings, and uh, the three-quarter round. Sorry if I'm going too fast. I'll slow down a little bit. I'll give you guys just a minute to catch up. So we're going to move on to the, the concave moldings. These are ones that are carved into material. Convex moldings are proud of the surface. They stick out, they bulge out. And the concave moldings are carved into that material, whatever it is. It could be wood or stone or, or metal. We're removing material. And they're like caves. Uh, they're partially or all in darkness because uh, of the shadow that's cast by the top edge. Um, and you'll notice that as we draw these, they're basically the inverse of the convex moldings. The first one we'll do is called uh, the cavetto. It's an Italian word that means little cave. The cavetto is a quarter round uh, inny molding. So if we draw our circle lightly here, and instead of taking the bottom right corner of it, we're going to take the top left. quarter of that circle. Draw our extension lines. And hatch that guy. And darken our cutting plane. Carpenters often call this a cove molding. Um, the, the cove molding or cavetto, it's often a, a terminating molding. So used at the top of a room or the top of a piece of furniture, uh, flaring out at, at the end. Next, we have the uh, one half hollow. What's the other name besides cavetto? So carpenters usually call it a cove molding. You might see a cove, like a cove ceiling. Uh, or you might hear that or see that at uh, the mill workshop. 
The Half Hollow, again, a very uncreative name. Someone needs to come up with a better name for Half Hollow. Just like the Taurus, just the inverse. So with the Half Hollow, we can draw that line at the top and at the bottom. And we're carving in a half of a circle instead of sticking out. It's kind of hard to freehand the circle. There we go, it's a little better. One half hollow. We'll hatch that so it's clear what we're cutting, some kind of material there. And the next one is uh, a three quarter hollow. I'm sorry, can you slow down again? Yep. Thank you. Yep, so we've got the covetto, which is a quarter of a circle, an any quarter of a circle. Uh, the half hollow, which is uh, one half of a circle in a concave curve. And next is the three quarter hollow. I have a question about the fascia. Yeah, go ahead. So if a fascia was kind of more like a sunk fillet, is that still a fascia or is that something different? If it, if it was, if it went in instead of going out? You could have a sunk fascia. Yeah, a fascia, uh, they're combined with other moldings. So we're drawing them in isolation. Right. But a, but a fascia may step to another fascia, step to another fascia. It may then step to a, a different molding of like an ovalo. And, and so, yeah, the fascia may be uh, recessed in from the next molding, or it could be projected out, or it could, a wall is a fascia, right? That's right. Just a flat okay. line is, is a fascia. And when so, we, go ahead. Either way, it's, it's a fascia, whether it's receding or protruding, it's a fascia. Yeah, and you could call the splay an angled fascia. Okay. Right. Good question. Three quarter hollow, uh, no mystery there. We'll draw, draw your circle. And then we'll take three quarters of that. Carve that out. Like that. That's our three quarter hollow. That's the part we're cutting through. And these last two are a little more challenging. The next one is called the Scotia. We've got two new vocabulary words for everybody. The Scotia and the Congé. It could be with or without the accent. Uh, the Scotia is often used uh, at the base of a column where we have this pattern. I'll just draw it down here because we're not going to use these two uh, squares here. You often see this at the base of a column. You'll have a torus and then uh, a scotia and then another torus and then sometimes a, a plinth, a, a fascia, but that's all. 
sitting on. Um, so you may see that like chess pieces have that shape too. So this molding right here is called the Scotia, this one. It's a concave molding that starts at one place and then ends out a little bit further. You'll notice that it's kind of the inverse of the thumb molding. And so uh, the way that we're going to draw it is uh, to start with the smaller circle at the top. You can draw the whole thing lightly, but we're just going to take one quarter of that and find the center. And for the, the rest of it, we don't want it to just be uh, the, the other half of that circle. We actually want it to come out further horizontally than we started. And so we're going to use a, a larger circle and make those uh, the ends of those curves tangent. So this, the center of this circle needs to be on the same horizontal uh, plane as the first one so that those, those edges on the left are tangent. And we complete the rest of the shape with that larger circle. And then just draw some extension lines so it's clear what we're drawing, what we're showing. Uh, I'm happy to do that one again if anyone was was lost. So the way you drew that, the second circle had twice the diameter, yeah. right, of the first one. But you yeah. said it doesn't have to be like that. It can have different variations. You have control as the designer to make that shape the way you want. Um, and we're drawing them all with parts of a circle. But uh, in other traditions, especially like the Greek uh, revival architecture, all of these shapes are done with uh, ellipses and parabolas. They're much more uh, sophisticated geometry. These are uh, the Roman or the, the Renaissance uh, profiles. And the Romans loved simplicity. Just, just dumb it down so everybody can do it. So that's the way we're, we're doing it tonight. But there's really endless possibilities with these shapes and in, in the variety that they have. So that's the Scotia uh, molding. It comes from uh, Greek, uh, Scotia, which means uh, something dark or, or a shadowy thing. So the, the, the Scotia, it really catches the, the cast the shadow with that hard edge right there. And, and then this kind of graceful curve that comes back out into the light. The conge is really just a cavetto, but it's put at the end of a fascia. Um, the, the conge is a French word. Um, it means a farewell or a bow, like you bow when you leave the, the king's throne room. So we're gonna connect it with a, a fascia. So we start with a fascia and then at the very top, uh, we add that cavetto, a quarter round. So it has that little flare curve at the top. And we can say that it's these are two shapes elided or fused together. Often in classical design, uh, there's a kind of a weaving or fusion of different elements that happens. So that's the the conge.
You guys are doing great. We're almost done. One more row to go. Does anybody need more time to catch up? Yes. Could you just okay. do that uh, kanji again, please? Sure. So the kanji, if you remember the kavetto over here, it's one quarter of a circle. And what we're going to do is we're going to add at the bottom of the kavetto, we're going to add a fascia without any kind of fillet or step back. It's just going to elide. It's going to become a straight line going, going straight down. So um, whether you start at the top or bottom, doesn't matter. We have a, a fascia that then uh, just effortlessly uh, becomes a curve at the top. It goes straight for a while, and then at the very top, flares out. Thank you. That's the conche. Our last row is the compound moldings. These combine a curve out and a curve in. So they have part of it that's concave and part of it is convex. And the first time, first two, we uh, have an, another vocabulary word. I often hear this pronounced uh, saima, but in Greek, apparently you pronounce it kima. So we have the uh, saima recta. And the sima reversal. The sima recta flares out at the top. Uh, so it's convex and then concave. So we're going to need to choose uh, a circle that we can uh, put two of them side by side for this. For the sima recta, let's see if it will fit. I want to go a little bit smaller than I've been using. I'll, I'll use this one. For the sima recta, those two circles are going to be adjacent left and right. So we draw one, just mark where the center of that is. And then we do another one to the right of that. Again, this is one way to do them. It's a rather clunky and inelegant way to draw the, the sima. It gives you these kind of heavy curves, but it's a simple way to, to learn it for tonight. And with the sima recta, what we're after is starting at this point right here at the bottom of our first circle. We're going to take a quarter of that one up to here where they touch. And then transfer to the other one and take a quarter of that circle. Draw some extension lines to sort of set that shape off, but that's the sima recta molding. Does anyone need me to do that again? Was that clear? So you just pick one of your circles, keep them the same radius. Obviously, it, they could uh, be different radiuses, right? That'd be one way to change this shape so that uh, it starts out with a big curve and then ends with a small curve. You can change the depth of these curves by using different angles. This could be tilted at different angles and so forth. But for uh, our purposes right now, we're gonna draw those two curves as one quarter of a circle, then it switches to the other circle. And uh, the, the sima recta, you could think of it like a, a sine wave, if you remember uh, trigonometry, where you've got this uh, wave that's going up and down. And it's just 
a cut portion of that sine wave is the sima rectus. The sima reversa, we're going to draw those two circles, one on top of the other. So our first circle, pi, and the second circle below that, trying to keep the centers aligned. And then again, we'll start at the bottom left. We'll take a quarter of that first circle and then a quarter of, uh, we'll transfer to the other side, the other circle to finish up. So the same reversa is just the reversa, the opposite of the sima recta. And while the, the sima recta is a terminating molding, it flares out like the cavetto at the top, the sima reversa is a supporting molding. So it bulges out at the top and re returns back. So it often be used where uh, there's something that like a bracket, something that it's supporting. It would be somewhat contrary to its nature to use the sima recta as a, a bracket, although you sometimes see that. Uh, usually brackets return back in as if they're bulging under that weight. And finally, we have the beak molding. So the beak molding, uh, we're gonna use two different uh, radiuses of uh, circles. And it starts with a concave and then uh, has a convex curve above it that kind of returns back towards where it began. So with the beak molding, we're taking a quarter of the first circle as a concave shape, right? We're carving out and then we're returning back with a convex. That one's called the beak for uh, obvious reasons. Those were a little more complicated. Does anybody need me to uh, review those or, or go over those? So we have our, our straight moldings. We'll just review those. We have the, the fascia, the raised and the sunk fillet display for our straight moldings. For convex, we have the ovolo, uh, the torus, the bead, the three-quarter round, and the, the thumb molding. And um, for concave moldings, we have the cavetto the uh, one half hollow, the three quarter hollow, the Scotia uh, and the Conge. And for compound moldings, we have the Sima recta, Sima reversa and uh, the beak molding. And you'll all want to use the correct names for these moldings from now on. Uh, so that you can Avoid words like uh, doohickey and thingamabob. Now we've got the, the correct uh, vocabulary for these words. Except for the ones you want us to rename. 
Yeah, who did anybody come up with a good name for those? Who's got a good name? The three quarter. That's just so lame and uncreative. The three quarter hollow, half hollow. Anyway, if you could, if you think of any names and uh, uh, want to send them in the chat or or email me, I'd love to have a new uh, word to call those. Um, I thought it might be fun just at the end. This is going to be a pretty easy uh, stuff. If you are familiar with CAD or SketchUp, these are very easy to draw in those programs. But I just wanted to um, uh, because I know most of our work uh, is done in uh, the digital uh, software these days. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Uh, and so I have uh, this same exercise that we did. Uh, you can very easily do it in uh, a CAD or a drafting program. For the sake of making it easier, uh, I just uh, let me change my camera here as well. Oh. Share my screen. Technology is amazing. All right, so uh, you can all see my my CAD screen here. Um, we have these lined up in the same way according to a shape, and uh, the straights are obviously very easy to draw. Right, uh, a fascia and a fillet. All we need to do is uh, keep those lines. Uh, orthogonal, um, and we can draw each of those uh, straight moldings, uh, a fillet at some point becomes a fascia. It's really a matter of how it's used. Uh, fillets are usually a punctuation at the beginning or end of another molding, uh, or they uh, create a separation between two different things. So I won't draw all of those straight moldings for the uh, convex moldings. The way I typically, if you're good at, at CAD and, and use arcs, you can just uh, use an arc command, but I usually uh, make it uh, just draw the full circle and then I can choose how much of that circle that I want for the oval. I'm just going to take a quarter of that circle. For a torus, I would take a half. And then uh, you trim off the rest of the circle that you don't want. Um, for the uh, thumb molding over here, you can see how uh, I've taken the, the top part of it to be a larger radius. And then the bottom part of the thumb molding uh, is a smaller radius. And then you can trim it um, where you want. So trim the top half. And trim the bottom half to get our, our thumb molding. The concave moldings, just like we did with the, uh, the convex. It's just a portion of uh, the circle. So the cavetto, if you remember, was uh, one quarter of the circle. Uh, 
and then we trim off what we don't want. Same with uh, half hollow, three quarter hollow, or someone's going to come up with a better name for those. The, the Scotia, again, starts with a uh, smaller radius of a circle and then ends with a, a larger one. So it starts uh, at one plane and, and ends further out. And then the, the conge is a fascia combined with the cavetta. And we trim what we don't need. CAD and, and Revit and SketchUp are really powerful tools. They can make uh, your job a lot easier as a designer uh, now that i have these right i can scale it up or down uh, i can easily combine them with the other moldings that i have to make more complex compositions and really quick i'll just do the the sima recta so we have two circles side by side of the same radius And all we need is a quarter of each of those. So we'll trim off the rest. And that's the, the Sima recta. Um, as I mentioned, this is kind of bonus material and I don't want anyone to feel uh, overwhelmed. But all of these shapes can be done uh, with different variations. So uh, the concave moldings, right? Uh, we did it as one quarter of a circle, but you could move that radius further away from your shape, like this one. And then you get only, you get less than a quarter of a circle. It's flatter. It's not as deep of a, uh, a curve or you could move the radius in towards the shape and cut out more of it. It's not quite three quarters, um, it's more than a half or, or more than a quarter, less than a half, right? The other uh, variation could be a different type of curve. So instead of a circle, we're using an ellipse and all of those ways of changing the shape will change uh, its character and would be appropriate for different styles of architecture. Um, if you're interested, I can uh, share these as, as PDFs um, to see the different variations. I have the, the concave, convex, uh, and con, uh, compound moldings, where instead of using the uh, quarter of a circle, uh, we're actually taking a different angle so that, that uh, those curves are less pronounced. And you can imagine just like pushing this even further and further and further until it almost becomes a splay, right? You just have so uh, these really subtle uh, curves, the more you push the, the uh, center of those circles away from each other. And, um, Combining all of these moldings together, uh, here we have, so a fascia at the bottom, and then a torus, a fillet, and the conge at the bottom. This is the base and capital of a, a Tuscan column. When we get up to the capital, we have again a conge, the, the fillet, a little torus, or we might call that a bead. It's kind of uh, ambiguous. Another fascia uh, that becomes the conge with the fillet, the ovolo, that quarter round, another fascia to the conge and a fillet. That, those are the moldings of, of the capital and we could uh, do the same thing with all of the moldings of the entablature and name them, no matter how complex it is, everything's made up of uh, those basic shapes and variations uh, of them. 
And I'll just quickly come over here to uh, a SketchUp file where I built that same thing in uh, three dimensions. So with our molding profiles here, you know, we can make all of these shapes quite easily in any 3D modeling program. And, and really these shapes, you know, we've drawn them as that simple profile, but how we experience them in architecture is extruded uh, to create shadow and edges. And so we can see here some of our shapes. So this is the three quarter hollow. This is the, the scotia, uh, some beads and, and the three quarter uh, round. <clears throat> we could just draw one together quickly as we wrap up. So I'll draw the, the torus molding. And, and we just need that point that, that's halfway uh, here between uh, our, our top and our bottom. So sometimes we may need to draw uh, an extra line or two to find that point, right? And then we get rid of what we don't need. That worked. Somehow I lost my. Let's try that again. There we go. And then I can just uh, extrude that shape. So that's the that's the torus. Any questions? One hour and 20 minutes, we did pretty well. Good job, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our class tonight. I really want to thank all of our um, sponsors and thank you for attending and uh, for drawing the moldings with me. I hope that you'll join us again. We have two more classes in this classical uh, primer series. So next week, one week from tonight, we will do the Doric order. And we have a guest uh, instructor for that. His name is Marty Burns. Uh, he's an architect in New York. He'll be teaching that class. And then um, uh, in one month, October 7th, we will do the uh, Ionic order. And uh, with the orders, we'll be composing these moldings. So we'll be putting them together in, in a combination to create uh, you know, one of the most beautiful things that you've ever drawn. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.